Okay, um, so in two lectures here, we'll go over bottomland hardwood silviculture. Uh, so hopefully saw a fair bit about it in the reading. And really this will be a little bit different than a lot of what we've been focusing on uh, because a lot of the bottomland hardwood silviculture that we'll use is primarily gonna be extensive silviculture. So pretty low intensity of management, not using fertilizer at all, um, not using nearly as many herbicides, not doing nearly as much tree planting. So it's more focused on different types of thinning and then how to get that stand regenerated, often focusing on natural regeneration. And we do that because we're often, you know, working in areas in, with species where the rotation is gonna be longer. Um, so it doesn't make sense often to invest as much uh, in our silviculture. And so what we're gonna be focused on, this sort of gives you the, the guideline for all two lectures in this diagram. <clears throat> and really what we're doing with these two lectures it's not per se introducing anything new, but rather what we're doing, and that's why it's at the end here, is we're tying everything together. Um, so we're tying together a bunch of different tools you can use and sort of everything you've learned in the prescription writing process, because now we're dealing with mixed stands. Mixed stands are more complex to manage. And so that's why this is at the end, not that bottom line hardwood silviculture is not important. So if you look at this diagram, um, which you'll notice I have some tools listed on there and you all have actually already used all these different tools. So cruise the stand there with the Meadows and Skojak tree classification system. Uh, that's what we did out at the lab at the ballpark woodlot. And so we've actually done that where you're trying to figure out the crown class, what the log grade is gonna be and then what the growing stock of your tree will be. Is it preferred, desirable, acceptable? cutting or coal stock, or is it that inferior superior pole stock? So we've already done that. So that box is that lab. Um, you can see an another box on here, Regenerate Goliadal. So that's gonna be the regeneration survey lab uh, where we went out and we did the method where you're putting in hundredth acre plots and you were counting the different red oaks and ash in there and getting a percent probability that that plot would adequately regenerate with red oak or ash. So we've done that as well. Um, during a normal year, you would have done Baker Broadfoot at Field Station. Uh, so I made a video of me digging up a hole uh, that many of you saw this past summer. But that's the tool where if you don't have that species out on the site at a given point in time, you can sample the soil. And then you go through a simple multiple choice test on what you're seeing with your soil pit um, or with the, the auger hole that you've dug. And you're using that to estimate what the site index will be on that site. Um, so we covered that at field station. And then the final tool listed on here in a few different places is goals, decide to manage or regenerate. And that's the Gingrich stocking guide um, adjusted for bottomland hardwoods that's in the useful handout packet and that we saw on a few slides in that lecture a couple weeks ago. So really what we're doing here, that diagram looks complicated, but it's just taking all the pieces you already have and it's tying them together. And so the other thing that's gonna be a little bit distinct with bottomland hardwood management that we have to keep our focus on. So when you do a thinning treatment, are you worried about seedlings? So if you go out and you third row thin a pine plantation, are you concerned with seedlings on the ground? No, thinning is managing the stand that you have. It's not focused on growing the next cohort. Regeneration treatments like seed tree, shelter wood, clear cut selection systems, those are what we've been talking about that's focused on growing your next cohort. So in many cases, if you know you're gonna plant the stand, there's a really clear division between the two. Everything we're gonna see with hardwoods, it, it becomes more complex. And so when you're gonna rely on natural regeneration of species that may have an ecology where it can be a little more challenging to regenerate them like oaks. We very frequently wanna manage oaks, but there can be a lot of reasons that regenerating oaks can be challenging that we're gonna go over you really wanna look at your thinning treatments and your other intermediate treatments that you're doing. And you wanna have the end of the rotation in mind. Whereas you do a thin, you know, you may be focused on, here's what I need to do to thin the stand based on that Meadows and Skojack tree class system where I'm leaving more desirable trees out there, removing less desirable trees. So when I enter that stand at my next entry, I'm gonna have even more valuable timber out there or I'm gonna have species that better meet my wildlife objective, recreation objective, whatever it is. But at the same time, in the back of your mind, you need to have the thought in there that 
hey, if I can also start building up this pool of advanced regeneration, lots of seedlings that I can grow into larger size classes, that's going to be something that's going to really help me down the line. Uh, or the next forester, you know, if this is a long rotation and you may not still be working with the stand um, by the time it gets regenerated. So let, let's go ahead and start thinking about that. So here's a couple different treatments, a commercial thin, and this would be a free thin using that Meadows and Skojack tree class system we did out at the ballpark. Um, and then think about a pre-commercial thin where maybe you're going in and mulching a stand, maybe it's small acreage, so you're in there mulching it, or you're doing a timber stand improvement using that narrow pre-commercial thinning definition uh, where you're improving form and composition of a stand by removing non-merchantable trees uh, of lower quality. So think about those two different treatments. And what I want you to think about is what could you do with each of them to improve the future regeneration potential of that stand? Um, how could you go about implementing them? What could you modify about their implementation that's gonna give you better regeneration potential decades later at the end of the rotation. So break into groups, take, take a moment and think about that. Okay, so what sort of modifications could you make to a commercial thin that would help you with regeneration? So what could you consider doing with that commercial thin that would help improve how many seedlings, saplings, seed production potential, anything like that? Okay, so you could use a different harvesting system. So occasionally in some parts of the country, you'll still see rarely where they'll have horse or uh, mule-based logging teams. Um, so that may be a possibility in some areas. I don't know that we have that as much around here, but yeah, you could try to find an operator that has smaller equipment. That's generally gonna be a good thing to do in a hardwood stand, um, not just for regeneration potential, but also to uh, keep the trees that you're retaining in good shape rather than going in there with really big Equipment intended to clear cut a pine stand that may be more difficult to maneuver. So, yeah, so trying to avoid damaging your seedlings, that's good. What else? When we talked about shelterwood, remember typically we saw some data showing that skid trails cover about 15, 16% of the area. Um, so, another thing you could do there is sort of flag out the skid trails to avoid some regeneration, but you know, even then, it's not going to hit the majority of your area. So, you know, what, what could you do with a commercial thin that might increase the ability of your dominant trees to produce seed? That's gonna help you down the line, right? So is a thin gonna help them improve their potential to produce seed, the trees that you leave? So if I take a big cherry bark oak here and I cut trees on two or three sides of it, how's the crown gonna respond? It's gonna get bigger, right? And what's our best indicator of seed production potential in many hardwoods? It's crown size, right? So in some cases, you know, there may be a lot of synergy already anyway. So what you're doing in that commercial thin already may be helping you. So just the fact that you're doing the commercial thin versus not doing it may set you up for greater success down the line because it may be doing a lot of things that you want to do later anyway. Remember when we talked about a prep cut for a shelter wood, how we talked about how you didn't need to do it. It was an optional treatment. And if you were thinning a stand and managing it well throughout the rotation, you probably don't need that prep cut. So again, if you go in there with these commercial thins and you do a good job, and you're also thinking about regeneration potential, you know, it, it can really, you know, you don't have to do much extra and it may work very well for you, right? Uh, but there may be some minor modifications you can make to it. Um, with a pre-commercial thin, so if you're in there mulching the stand, something like that, um, what modifications might you make? So this might be earlier in the rotation, um, or this might be a stand that hasn't been managed well in the past. That would be the reason you're doing a pre-commercial thin, right? You can't remove anything merchantable yet. So think about what we did uh, with that long leak prescription on Tuesday. What, what was an issue out there that you had to fix in order to get good regeneration. Yeah, so the litter layer, right? So we can manipulate that sometimes with, with different silvicultural operations. So, you know, if you had some problem there, you know, you might be able to address it uh, with an operation like this. So, so, so again, with, with a pre-commercial thin, you're probably, you know, 
working at a disadvantage. If you're having to do that operation, you know, things haven't been going well, most likely in that stand. Um, and that's going to be another point of emphasis we'll get into here today where, you know, if you go into a stand and the quality is just so low, it's been mismanaged, it's been high graded for so long, you may be thinking, you know, is this stand even worth managing? Do I need to, you know, regenerate it now? And so you may not even be thinking about doing a pre-commercial thin uh, if it's in really bad shape. So, but a lot of the same concepts apply with the commercial thin or with the pre-commercial thin, you can try and meet many of those objectives you might in the prep cut in a shelter work. So, you know, you may be removing undesirable seed sources, getting them out of the stand as early in the rotation as you can. So if that's a species where the seed can remain in the seed bank for a longer period of time, you remove it earlier. So it's less of a worry later, you know, when you're regenerating the stand, it doesn't become as bad of a weed species in your next stand. So th there's still other things we can think about there. So one thing that they've commonly run into uh, with hardwood management and those who had field station this past summer watched some videos sort of talking about this, the idea of mesification. Um, I know some of you taking bottom line hardwood silviculture have gotten into this, but um, with mesification, basically, you know, to put it real succinctly, we've removed fire from a lot of our hardwood ecosystems that might've had fire in them naturally. And so especially in upland hardwood systems, what we see is species like red maple coming in at greater abundances than they once would have because we've quit burning. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems. You're shifting the composition of your stand in an undesirable way, but it's also changing the litter layer characteristics, making the stands more difficult to burn in the future. Um, and so it's, it's causing all sorts of problems, but this is kind of a typical stand you would find in many areas in the Eastern United States where you have an overstory that's 80 to 100 year old and it's oak dominated. But that 80 to 100 year old overstory was established maybe when they just cut the whole stand. They may have just clear cut it and the oaks came back on their own. They weren't really trying to regenerate oaks, but that's what they did. And now we're looking at managing these areas, but you look, walk in there and you do a regeneration survey and you work up stand data, you do a timber cruise and this is what you find. You have a really nice oak overstory on the right there where all your big, large overstory trees are oaks. But then you look in the size classes that you would look for for a regeneration survey, one to two inch DBH trees, two to four inch DBH trees, and then trees that don't even have a DBH yet. And it's all red maple. So if you go and you put a shelter wood into this stand or a group selection or, you know, one of our civil cultural systems, it generally tends to favor the maples. And so when you do that, you're converting a stand from an oak stand that has high timber value, high wildlife value, you know, people like oaks, and you're converting it mostly to a red maple dominated stand. And red maple doesn't have nearly as much timber value. It's a soft maple, doesn't have nearly as much wildlife value. It's seeds dispersed by wind primarily. Um, and so, you know, you're converting the composition in a way that you really don't want. So this is sort of the management condition that a lot of folks managing oak forests in the Eastern US find themselves in where, you know, what do you do there? How do you reintroduce fire maybe? How do you go in and do hack and squirt or something to start dealing with the maples here? Um, but it, it's challenging and you're not gonna fix it in one treatment. This has occurred over decades and decades and decades of poor management. And it's gonna take uh, several decades of good management to start shifting composition back to something where you can adequately regenerate the oaks, hopefully. And so let, let's start by thinking about a new stand on this diagram. And I'll show you this diagram periodically throughout these two lectures, just to sort of give us context with where we are. Um, so let's say you have a new stand. So let's say maybe you want to convert an old field uh, to a hardwood stand. Um, that would be one example. The first thing we're really going to need to do is understand the species site relationship. So one reason that foresters like lava like pine, you heard Mr. Grogan say it in that video, is you can plant it pretty much anywhere and it will probably be fine. You don't really need to know a whole lot about the soils or the site to get lava like pine to survive on a site. But now when we're talking about hardwoods, now we're talking about dozens of different species and those species may have a narrower uh, range of sites on which they'll survive at high rates on and do well. So we need to be able to link the species to the site. 
So to do that, we first have to start characterizing our bottomland sites. And our bottomland sites around East Texas, they may not have great ranges in elevation, they're relatively flat, but even small gradients in topography can make big differences on what our soils look like and the soils will really shape uh, what forest community can grow there. And so when we look at this, what this is shaped by primarily is just some basic physics. And so we know around here, our rivers tend to flood, our streams tend to flood. And as that stream moves out of the, the stream bed, okay, it moves out of the main channel, it starts moving across vegetation, uh, maybe slight changes in topography. And basically the further the water moves away from the main stream channel, the slower it starts going. As water moves more slowly, generally it has lower velocity and that tends to reduce the energy that water has, which means it can carry less. And so if you look at real steep, high gradient streams up in mountainous regions where they get a lot of rainfall or snow melt, if you get a severe event like that, you can have that stream moving large boulders, okay? But then the water velocity drops a little, the volume of water moving, the discharge drops a little, and they can no longer move those. They don't have the energy. Well, around here, we're not moving boulders with our streams, but what we're thinking about moving is really sand, silt, clay, our different soil textures, maybe small gravel, okay? And so when we look at sand, silt, and clay, what's the smallest particle size of those three soil textural classes? Clay, so clay has our smallest particle size, sand has our largest, silt is in the middle. So what we tend to see happen on that graph on the left there is that diameters are increasing from left to right. So your clays would be at the far left, then your silts would be somewhere in the middle and your sands would be further to the right. Not all the way to the right, because you can see uh, we're at diameter in millimeters. So, you know, your sands are probably a millimeter or less in diameter on average. And so basically what happens there is it takes, you, you can see a logarithmic axis on stream velocity there on the Y axis. So it's not just increasing by one, two, three, it's one, 10, a hundred, a thousand. So it's going up by a factor of 10 each time. And so you can see with a clay soil, it takes a lot of energy, fast moving water to erode the clay. That makes sense because clay binds tightly together. But then see the green shaded area on the bottom right that says deposition. So the water can basically, if it's moving at all, clay is not going to deposit. Okay. Um, how many times have you seen one of our rivers or streams here in East Texas and the water has been cleared? We don't tend to see that, right? And it's because we have clay in suspension and about the only way that clay comes out of suspension is if the water moves into a back swamp and completely stops moving. Um, it may even need to evaporate out and that will end up depositing the clay. So basically you're not gonna deposit clay by slowing the water down a little bit. But if you look, as we move to the right, look at that one millimeter size class. Now, maybe if that's a, a pretty coarse sand you know, it still takes a fair bit of energy to erode it, not as much as it would a clay, but then there's that pretty narrow range where with certain velocities it'll transport, but if it slows down a little bit, that sand drops out of suspension. And so you end up depositing it. And so what this does is it shapes all these different features that we see our rivers and streams creating in our bottomland hardwoods, where as the rivers are moving over time, they're creating different meanders. The meanders are getting cut off and creating oxbow lakes. You know, those oxbow lakes may, you know, fill with water and they may drain. Um, we end up with back swamps. We end up with, you know, sloughs. They're calling it a Yazoo stream here. Um, but throughout all of that, what you see happening is you form these different soil textures. This is right out of the reading y'all did last night, where right by the river, that's where your coarser sands deposit. Then you'll have natural levees where you tend to deposit finer sands. On the backside of them, you'll get your silts depositing out. And then in the back swamps, you have your clays. And so that's gonna shape the different soil textures you have as you move away from the river. So if you have a species like black cottonwood and it needs sandy textured soils and lots of light to grow, what's the right site for cottonwood? It's going to be right there by the river, right? Okay, so the movement of the river and how that deposits different soil textures dictates where you find cottonwood on the landscape. 
So we have to understand soils in this, you know, I've shown you some diagrams, you know, there's more diagrams. It sounds pretty abstract. This is what it looks like when it happens. So this was a research site where we would just planted a bunch of seedlings. Um, this was out at Richland Creek WMA. And then randomly in the Corsicana area, they got like 39 inches of rain one day in October. And so it flooded real bad. And, you know, when you're planting six inch tall seedlings and then you get two feet of soil sediment really deposited on your site, uh, we had pretty complete mortality there. So, uh, but, you know, one heavy, heavy rain event and boom, you've got completely different parent materials here uh, forming your soils. And in this, these areas, the soils tend to stay young. They don't have time to develop before a new load of sediment is dumped out on top of them again. So, and so you saw in the reading, you know, this will differ between major and minor river bottoms, um, where major rivers like the Mississippi, you know, the sediment may be from hundreds of miles away. It could come from all sorts of different textures. You know, some of that sediment might come from Illinois or Iowa, where they have those rich prairie soils. Um, it might come from areas that include shrink swell clays. And so it could be extremely variable. Um, when you start looking at minor streams, like many of the rivers we have here that originate basically in Texas and go right to the Gulf, so they're relatively simple riverine systems, you know, the sediment can only come from so far away because it's a, a minor river. Um, it may be sandy in the lower coastal plain, could be clay or loamy, just depends on the areas uh, that it goes through. Um, if you ever, you know, spend any time on the Sabine River, for example, or drive across it on bridges, you see that white sand everywhere, right? Um, so we see a lot of sand along the Sabine, for example. So it's just going to depend. And then what you tend to see is you will get different species associating with these different topographic positions on both the major and minor streams. So this, this diagram was in your reading, but it's just an exaggerated diagram showing you all these different topographic positions where you'll have the bar right along the, the river there on a major stream valley where you would find willow. And then the, the raised levee or front there, you might find cottonwood on that. Um, then on the back of it where you start getting loamier textured soils, that's where you start picking up elm, sycamore, pecan, sugarberry. And then you may have sloughs, lower areas where we're finding overcup oak. You get into those back swamps that are real clay, and that's where we may have cypress, water tupelo, swamp tupelo. Um, and so you you're really have this variable composition um, as you move throughout the topography. Think about the experimental forest lab we did in Dendro, where we went from the area where we learned overcup oak and planar tree, and then, you know, just, you know, a couple hundred yards over, the composition varies completely, and you start picking up laurel oak, willow oak, water oak. And so that wasn't a huge difference in elevation, but it was enough that it makes a big difference in composition. So when you're out on the ground, this probably isn't gonna look like this. Um, it's gonna be six inches of elevation change. So it may be hard to find it on a map. Uh, think about when we did the regeneration surveys where we went out and we did the stop quadrat surveys in that overcup oak flat. And then we walked up, what, maybe a foot or two in elevation onto that ridge and the composition completely changed where we were looking at water oak, willow oak, um, and we were seeing sweet gum and other species like that. So it really doesn't change, take much elevation around here uh, to see those changes in composition. And so again, you know, Eastern cottonwood, you'll have in those sandy textured soils, it's gonna need bare mineral soil to germinate on, very, very small seed. Um, we've actually done a fair bit of cottonwood management in the South. Uh, they planted a lot of it in like the 60s uh, a lot of focus on intensively managing it just to make a lot of biomass fast. So cottonwood, you know, in the first few years, you can have nine-year-old cottonwood that's 50 plus feet tall. And so you can get it growing very, very rapidly if you manage it very intensively. Um, both cottonwood and black willow, these are the species where you can't really buy seedlings for them. Rather, what they're going to give you is cuttings. And so those cuttings, it, it looks like a pile of sticks. That's really what it is but you take them and you put them down in, down in the soil and they'll root um, and grow into a new tree. Um, you can even put them in the ground upside down and they will root and grow into a new tree, but it you know, doesn't have the best form. So you wanna make sure the planters know which end is down on some cuttings. Um, establishing cottonwood plantations, some of the challenges are herbivory by deer. 
um, that can be an issue. And then uh, good herbicide applications in the first year or two um, to you know, keep them from getting outcompeted uh, by herbaceous species. Um, a lot of these sites you know, around East Texas here, especially our old fields, pastures uh, that you're converting, you, know, you might go out there and have a six foot herbaceous layer that you're just wading through. Um, so it, it's real hard for trees to survive in there. If you ever work on projects like that where you're trying to relocate seedlings and see how they're doing, it's really difficult to find them. Uh, you're, you're literally you know, climbing through a six foot tall file of brush often. So. Uh, Black Willow, sort of same idea, similar sites to uh, Eastern Cottonwood. Um, and, you know, Black Willow, occasionally you'll see it managed. Um, often, um, you know, it has poorer form. Uh, you won't see it managed as much. And then Sugarberry, Elm, Ash, Pecan, uh, we'll have a lot of these cover types on the loamier textured soils um, right on the back of that front. And so still very wet sites. And there, I mean, your, your elm has decent value. It's used for pallets, crates, things like that. Not the highest value, but decent value. But then ash is a real high value timber species. You know, maybe we're not managing it as much anymore with the emerald ash borer, but pecan's got high timber value. And again, you've got pretty good wildlife value in a cover type like this with the pecan, the sugarberry. So. Then you get up on the ridges. And so these are trees that like mesic sites, but they don't really uh, handle flooding nearly as well. And that's where we find our water oak sweet gum, uh, nut all oak in our area, green ash. And so here you see what one of these stands might look like uh, after a low thinning where it's being managed for timber. So. Um, that photo looks like it was taken in 1992 if the date on it is correct, probably, yeah, by Brian Lockhart. So I, I don't know what site he was out on, but we could have taken the same exact photo when we did that regen survey lab, right? If you've been to one over cup oak flat, you've pretty much been to all of them. Um, <laughs> they're all very, very similar. And so even age stand. And, you know, as you look at these, you may have some water hickory in there. Um, these are stands where, you know, we have a lot of them out on state and federal lands where they're managing for wildlife. And if you look at a stand like that, it really doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of uh, wildlife habitat value to it. Um, so there's a lot of focus on these areas, putting in desired forest or desired stand conditions where they go out and they're basically doing group selection to try and shift this even aged forest to an uneven aged forest. Uh, but of course, if you're doing that, you know, it's going to take a period of years for it to work because if the water lines on the trees are, you know, eight to 10 feet tall, you know, you're not going to get seedlings established in just any given year. You need to get, you know, lucky a few years in a row to get the right flooding regime in order to get a new cohort established there. And then here's a cypress water tupelo. I got a couple of these photos at field station a while ago, back when you know we had field station outside. Um, but you know these cypress tupelo swamps, some of them still haven't been logged. Um, so this was one we used to go to down by the Neches. That's actually a water tupelo on the bottom right, not a um, black gum. Uh, I think these photos were actually during that 2011 drought so we didn't even get our boots wet that year. Normally you're standing in waist deep water right there in the middle of the summer. But, but uh, you know, this was a big cypress we used to go to back in field station where you could fit the whole class in front of the one tree um, with the buttress roots and everything. It was probably 15 plus feet wide, so. And then you start moving back even further and you start getting, you know, starting to transition a little bit to the uplands. That's where you'll find cherry bark oak, sweet gum, um, and so these are cover types that, you know, people really want to manage for wildlife, for timber, lots of value here. So here's an example of a cherry bark oak sweet gum stand where they've done a crown thinning um, and they've even pruned them, which you, you rarely see done, uh, more an experimental approach. Um, but, you know, here they're getting good mass developments. So this would be an example where you're managing for both timber and wildlife here. And then on the minor river bottoms, it's the same sort of idea, except without those really, really large rivers, you know, everything's going to be smaller. The floods are smaller. They have less potential to shape the topography. The floodplains are smaller. If you look at the Mississippi River floodplain, I mean, it could be miles and miles and miles across. Um, may not be quite as significant here um, with the minor stream valleys. And you know you may transition where you're not finding as much cottonwood and, and black willow. It may be more river birch, 
um, on those sandier textured soils right by the river. And then you get onto the, the loamier textures, you start picking up beach. We have a lot of American beach in our SMZs we see, right? Sweet gum, sycamore, if you go further east, it's where you'll start picking up yellow poplar as well. Um, you may start picking up spruce, oak, spruce pine. So that's Pinus glabra. It's uh, native east of the Mississippi. We don't have it here in East Texas, but this is, that pine's kind of the opposite of the Southern yellow pines. If you see it, you'll kind of confuse it for short leaf, little bitty cones, but it, its wood is brittle, uh, rots very easily. It's not durable. It's shade tolerant, beavers will eat it. So it's the complete opposite of the Southern yellow pines we learned in lab here, right? So you've got all these different species and that just shows you some of those cover types. So how the heck do you know what tree to put where? Especially if you're working on an old field that you're converting to a forest where you can't just see what trees are out there. If you already have a forest and you already have cherry bark oak or sweet gum or a species of interest that's growing well on it, you know that that species is probably well suited to that site. That's your best indicator that a species is suited to the site. Uh, but if you go out there and the tree isn't there, you know, if cherry bark oak isn't on a site, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a cherry bark oak site. It might just be that it's been high graded out because it's one of our highest value species. So it might've been present on that site in the past, but is, is not there now. Um, or if it's an old field, I mean, you might not have any trees on that site. So um, here's an example of some data where they looked at bald cypress, water tupelo and green ash. And what you can see uh, these different clusters of bars are, it's the water table depth relative to the soil surface. So the water table was 10 inches below the soil surface there on the far left. So that's your driest site. And looking at this gradient, it went from four inches below to two inches above. So on the right, it's our wettest site. And no surprise there where you see the bald cypress doing the best in terms of survival on the wettest site, uh, much more poorly on the drier site where water tupelo seems to have the advantage there. But you can see if you put the wrong species out on a site, look at the survival percentages, 20% or less there, if you put the wrong species out on those sites. So if we put the wrong species on a site, there's a few different things that could happen, right? You could get a flood or a drought where it just flat out kills that, that tree. But what's another major factor that's gonna reduce survival if you put a species on a site it's not well suited to? So if you plant a bald cypress in your yard, can you grow it into a nice big tree? Regardless of whether that's a good bald cypress site or not. So what's the difference between your yard and just planting it out on a similar soil where you're not doing anything, you just leave it alone? What are, you do what are you doing in your yard that gives that bald cypress the chance to grow well? So you may be irrigating, so you may be changing the site a little, so that may be one factor. What's the other major factor? The thing you really don't want to do on a summer afternoon? You're mowing. You're literally controlling the competition around that tree. And so in this same study, when they looked at the survival of the seedlings that they planted, that blue line that goes low on the left to high on the right, it's exactly the opposite of the trees that were out there that were unplanted. And so where you get low survival, often the trees that aren't surviving are being outcompeted. That's what's killing them off. Ultimately, they're being outcompeted by species that are better suited to that site. And so it's going to be important to figure out which species are suited to a site. And so again, I, I still have the video up from Field Station on the YouTube channel. You can go find it. Um, but you know, we have this tool, Baker Broadfoot. Uh, where you can take Baker Broadfoot and it's going to look at four different properties, the physical condition, uh, moisture, nutrients, and aeration in the soil. And you just fill out a multiple choice test. And what it'll do is those are the species listed there that it works for. It's really intended for the Mississippi alluvial valley. And we're out here on the Western fringes of Southern bottomland hardwoods. So you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt in our region. It wasn't really intended to work here, but it's still the best tool that we have. So you go out, you do your soil sampling. That's what a normal field station looks like. That was in the summer. Um, and then it's got, you know, three or four tables in it for cherry bark oak. So you just start going through here and answering each question. And then for each question, there's a bracketed number underneath it. Six, three, six, six, one. You're adding those numbers to our estimate of site index. And so when you get done with all that, it's giving you an estimate of site index, but it's not site index. So they call it site quality rate, but it's interpreted exactly the same as site index.
And so basically you can look through Baker Broadfoot and that publication, they give you these guidelines. It's a freely available forest service publication and they're using an SQR sub 30. So they're using a 30 year site index for cottonwood. That's about the only 30 year site index I've ever seen, but they're giving you a 50 year site index for the other species. And they basically tell you if you go out and you use this tool and you're trying to manage for cherry bark oak and you get a number less than 70, that would mean the site index estimate on that site is going to be less than 70 feet at 50 years old. That's probably not a good cherry bark oak site. So no reason to try and manage that site for cherry bark oak. Um, you should be thinking about other species out there. Broadfoot came up with some other tools. Um, so he came up with another tool here in, in the late 60s, late 60s, early 70s, um, where what you could do, the, the idea here was we have sweet gum probably on all our sites. So go out, get the site index of a sweet gum and use that to predict the site index of a species that isn't sweet gum. So what you could do here, if you have a sweet gum, you estimate site index on it, what you can do is look at the x-axis. If your sweet gum site index was 90 feet at 50 years, right there in the middle, you follow 90 straight up. So you go up from 90 and you see that line is labeled GA for green ash. And where 90 hits that line for green ash, I look over on the y-axis and it says 80. And so that means if my site index for sweet gum is 90, I'm estimating my site index at green ash at 80 feet at 50 years. So it allows you to convert from sweet gum to other species. It's not a perfect tool. Um, you know, some folks will tell you it's very difficult to age sweet gum, um, that it's hard to count the rings on it. Um, so I've heard that. Uh, here's a couple of sweet gums at the old house we used to live at that were in my backyard. And I took this picture in about 2012, 2013. But we kind of saw this across much of East Texas where that 2011 drought basically temporarily lowered sweet gum site index for a year. And so we had tops dying like crazy on a lot of our sweet gums. And so uh, they didn't pop back, you know, over the years after they, you know, grew a little bit, but they didn't get back to that original height really. So it may, you know, that one drought event over one summer may have artificially lowered sweet gum site index if you try to estimate it. So there can be some challenges there, but it's really the best tool we've got to convert site index between species. Um, in different other regions in the country, the Appalachians, they've got some tools where it's all on one graph where you can see the comparison of site index across different species. And so, you know, that, that sort of gets you at the idea of, yes, this is a good site for this species or no, it isn't. And then you go to plant this. And you've seen these slides before. We've already talked about this. Again, the purpose of these two lectures is just to put all the pieces together for hardwood management where you, know, you may need a bigger dibble bar, you may need bigger seedlings, you may need planting shovels to get your hardwoods in the ground well. You may have a much higher cull percentage. That 10% cull percentage may not do it for hardwoods. You're gonna be wanting to throw out trees with poor root forms, fork trees. Uh, you don't wanna waste time and money putting those in the ground. And then re remember, we already talked about how do you mix the seedlings? If you just give a hand planting crew you know, access to piles of 10 different species and they get paid by how many trees they put in the ground, they're gonna go for the smallest trees because they can put more of them in the ground quicker and you're gonna have all those planted in one corner of your stand. The planter that was the slowest got the biggest trees, those all get planted in a different corner of your stand and you end up kind of with just a bunch of single species blocks out there. Um, so if you wanna manage for timber, figure out a way to get your planting crew to put in maybe rows of species and that may be operationally efficient. If you want to simulate, you know, a natural stand, you want to manage for aesthetics or wildlife, you know, get a good mix. So go ahead and mix up the seedlings ahead of time, take the extra time to do that, get them to the planters, and then they'll, they'll get them planted in a real mix. So, and then of course, there's lots of other things we've talked about with hardwoods you need to think about. Stem form is more challenging on hardwoods, right? Um, so if you think back, there was like a three or four minute video on hardwood plantations. You saw if you did field station this past summer, but you know, if you go out and you put in one species of oak on a 10 by 10 foot spacing, you know, that's, that's a great prescription for a pine plantation. We know that works well for a pine plantation, but our pines are X current species. They have one main stem, good self, good apical dominance. They self prune well. Okay. And we've been breeding them for better branch characteristics. You go put an oak out on that, that spacing and you're gonna get some really ugly trees if you're trying to manage for timber. So they are gonna be limmy, they are gonna fork, 
So you probably want to go at a higher density. And what we're finding more and more is when's the last time you walked into a forest and it was all white oak or all willow oak or all, you know, cherry bark oak. We don't tend to find that. Oaks are one component of a mixed forest. And so we tend to be getting better success if you go out and you plant half cherry bark oak and half sweet gum. And what we tend to find is the sweet gum or other trees you could be using uh, may act as a nurse tree or a buddy tree. We'll look at data on this next class where it may overtop it for a period of years, but then the oak catches back out, catches back up, wins out, um, and you end up with good form on the oak. It grows straight, it self prunes better, um, it, it doesn't form. So you may need a higher density. You may need a mixture of trees in order to get that one um, species that you really want to grow for saw timber in that shape by the end of the rotation. So a, a little more complexity there than what we see with pine. And then we talked about herbivory already, right? Where I showed you, you know, pigs chewing the roots off of different seedlings, deer top clipping them. We talked about different fencing treatments you had, right? And um, the, the one that seems to be more operational is some sort of individual tree shelter. Um, fencing treatments are typically prohibitively expensive. And so your, your best option is probably individual tree shelters. Um, they don't always work. You know, we were out in um, the Ozarks looking at some Ozark chinkapin they were trying to grow um, in tree shelters like this. And, you know, they're good places for yellow jackets to make nests and wasps. And then, you know, you may have trees in there that die, get fire ants in there. So they're not perfect, but you know, they may be your best option to prevent herbivory. And so hopefully you get everything right. But another thing you've got to think about with the hardwood stands like this, uh, you need to clearly communicate with the landowner, you know, this is not pine, this might fail. And so, especially if you are in an area that you know can flood in a given winter, you know, you need to let them know this might fail. We're gonna try it if you want. Uh, but we can't guarantee you're going to get good survival this winter. This may mean we need to plant this stand two, three, four times in order to achieve a success out here. And that can, that can be, you know, tough to consider when you think about the fact that these hardwood seedlings, they're not $57 a thousand, they're $250 a thousand. So your seedlings may cost about four times as much as our cheapest bare root pine seedling. So, uh, but if the landowner still wants to do it, you know, it's their money as long as they're well informed going into it and it's within their risk tolerance, um, that should be fine. So, so that, that's where I'll stop for today and we'll do the other half of this on Tuesday. Any questions on hardwood silviculture?